Hello and welcome to Penmanship, a podcast about Australian writing culture. I'm your host, Andrew McMillan, and today we have something a little different to what has been heard elsewhere on the podcast. My guest is Lizzie Lowell, a restaurant critic for Q Weekend magazine and a freelance writer. As a regular reader of Q Weekend, I've been intrigued by Lizzie's reviews in the last couple of years she's been in that role. Her writing is sharp and evocative, but what has interested me most is that her restaurant ratings are on a scale of 20, and she rarely awards higher than a 15 out of 20. This has created the perception in my mind, and in the mind of others, that she's a tough marker, a critic who's hard to please. We talk about this perception at some length in our conversation, which also touches on Lizzie's upbringing on a sheep and cattle station in Western Queensland, her experience as an apprentice chef in Brisbane and Paris, the difficulties associated with perfecting the art of making an Indian curry, how she developed her palate and food vocabulary, how Lizzie got into restaurant criticism, and her unique method of writing reviews without taking notes, as well as the type of reader she keeps in mind when reviewing restaurants for Kiwi Kend. This interview was recorded at Lizzie's home in Paddington, Brisbane, on a Friday morning in June at her dining room table. Her obsession with all things food was evident through the fresh ingredients on the table beside us, as well as the countless cookbooks and food magazines in her living room. You'll even hear her cat making its presence known at a couple of points in our conversation, just to add to the ambient noise. Introducing Lizzie Lowell, restaurant critic at QWeekend and freelance writer. Well, thank you for meeting me. It's a pleasure, Andrew. I thought I'd ask a uh, kind of typical public radio question to begin with. What did you have for breakfast? Well, <laughs> I wish this was every morning, but I had um, I had a um, slice of sh- uh, challah bread, which is a Jewish soft white bread, um, and that had a slice of halloumi on it and um, two sixty-three degree eggs. Right. A little bit of. Um, Eggs Benedict, uh, the hollandaise sauce. So it's, it's sort of a Jewish take on Eggs Benny. All right, interesting. Mm. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention before we started, um, if you could try to avoid bumping the table. Oh, okay, sure. Awesome, because in the past it's been a problem as well. Yeah, still, I'm still does. learning. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. I'm a music critic, mm-hmm. and part of my job means that I'm constantly analysing music. Whenever I hear it, I'm thinking about songwriting and structure and composition, all those kind of things. Are you the same with food? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a it's a twenty four seven thing. It's yeah, there is no such thing as a, a, a sort of a a meal that isn't thought about, or mm-hmm. or I can't look at that over there at those oranges without um, my brain instantly going into a, a recipe hmm. or what I do with it, um, and also how it how else it could look. So I look at alternatives. I'm always, I think, in a, in a sort of photographic way these days. Right. That seems to have developed from years and years of um, thinking about what, reading a menu while I'm reviewing a restaurant and thinking, what did I photograph last week? What should I photograph next week? Hmm. How do the colours work? So I'm always thinking ahead and, and back and uh, coming up with sort of hopefully a variety you know so that and the diversity and then I also you've got to look at the 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 restaurant itself and what's going to be indicative Mm. of that so yes it food is always in my head (laughs) are you always rating things though like would you have rated your breakfast oh yeah yeah (laughs) I really wanted to answer no to that (laughs) I really (laughs) did but no I rated it Uh (laughs) yeah I, I mentally rated it definitely I didn't verbalise it, uh, and I was there for fun, but <laughs> I definitely rated it. Right. Do you in- enjoy that aspect of thinking about food, or do you sometimes wish you could switch it off? Yeah, well, look, I didn't really know I did it until just now, um, so you just asked me that. So <laughs> I, I sort of, my, I want it, as I say, I wanted to say, no, of course not, but yeah, I do. Wow. And so I don't really know I do it, so it doesn't bother me. Yeah. So I, guess it's not a problem <laughs> it might be now though <laughs> oh no <laughs> no it's all right i hope not no no it'll be fine <laughs> well i'm only familiar with your work in qe in the last mm-hmm. few years mm-hmm. so we can come to that later on but mm-hmm. i thought i'd begin by asking you 
did you aspire to be a writer when you were growing up? Uh, no, I aspired to be a chef. Uh-huh. I, um, I grew up with um, a mother who wasn't interested in cooking, and it was a chore for her. Uh, but I was born on a sheep and cattle station in Western Queensland, um, and so the our diet is quite limited because we're you know we're eight miles from our letterbox and mm. you know forty k from in a town. You, you groceries are once a week, and they're what you can get. You know, back this is going back forty years. So um, you know, milk was powdered. Um, That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and you know there was a lot of lamb <laughs> you know and mutton you know that we ate and but one of my aunts who lived in a neighboring property um did a cordon bleu course in london and so she had a very different take and my grandmother was one of the a, one of the stronger sort of um women in the cwa and so you know that association did a, a great deal of community work but it was focused on food what was the name of that town? Or St George yeah, in right. Western Queensland. So, hmm. I see. And what did uh, your auntie pass on to you from um, Sri Lanka? Well, I mean, my early memories are of sitting, you know, near the, the Aga, the kitchen. The, there was an Aga that literally went the whole wall of of the kitchen, and then out of outside there was a slaughterhouse, and um, so that's where all the meat was. Um, the beasts were killed and hung and aged. So, and then there, on the other side of the house, there, there was an orchard. So, the smells, those things are, will send me straight back to St George. Like if I smell orange blossom, mm. I will, I will travel time travel back into my childhood. It's it's remarkable. Um, and I didn't think I knew what I, I. I don't think I had any idea. Of, I wasn't one of those kids that said, "When I grow up, I'm going to be." Um, and but it was I also we, we moved to Brisbane and um, I had uh, went to school with uh, uh, my best friend at school um, her mother was Jan Power or is Jan Power who's the Jan Powers Farmers Markets right of course and Jan was a well-known food identity in Brisbane so from my sort of formative teens on she became a mentor for me mm. and then when I left school I just looked at her one day and said what the hell am I going to do and she said you know what you're going to do I said what and she said you're going to be a cook hmm. that's what you've always done and I said yes okay that's you're right <laughs> sounds, sounds right <laughs> yeah, it did sound right and it was right so I was that for many years before I was a chef for many years before I became a writer okay wow did you have siblings do you have siblings yes I have one older sister who isn't really interested in cooking <laughs> she, she's a doctor so hmm. she has um you know, she's developed an interest over the years, but she calls she's diagnosed me as a compulsive garnisher. <laughs> Is that accurate? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so your parents ran that cattle station and um, sheep station. Mm. Did you partake in the slaughtering type activities or um, kind of no? The shearing um, we did. You know, when when it was shearing time, it means you know lots of shearers come. They you know we have quarters and they all stay and. Um, my mother would and the station hands um, wife would cook for them all and so it was a big deal you know it, it wasn't fancy food but it was you know it was three meals a day for as long as it took you know a week or so yeah. and so that that was you know that was pretty amazing to see you know and it, it, smoko is such a big thing uh, for for them and so it's really five meals because mm. morning and afternoon tea are pretty um pretty have to be pretty substantial because they work so incredibly hard Hmm. and you know so if they take a break they only take 15 minutes they're paid per beast i think and um so the breaks are short and so you've you've got to be on time and so it's it it takes a lot to do and it was interesting i did become a caterer rather than a restaurant chef and you know so i don't know whether that's got any bearing but that that was my first uh, initiation, I suppose, in, into timed bulk cooking. So it's more about quantity in that case than uh, it's the individual preparation of it. Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you've got to be able to say, well, I'm going to do, do that and I'm going to multiply it out by 30 or 40, yeah. you know. And so it's very different to a la carte, hmm. you know, very different. My son is an a la carte chef. Right. And um, so we have really different skills. <laughs> 
Were you a good student? Terrible. Did you like any of your classes? I hated all class except ah. home ec. Ah. I hated school. I did. I loved French and English, um, and I didn't do too badly at those ones. I just wasn't a maths girl, and I, I've, I've just, I, I know it's cliched, but I remember being twelve and saying, "I'm never going to use this," and I never have. <laughs> you know, and and so. And I've watched my boys blossom since they left school as well because there's so much in the school curriculum that doesn't apply to them unless they're the kind of kids or we're, or we're the kind of kids that don't really have a clear direction. Then I think the broad scope really helps because it does give them a taste of a lot of things. But my boys all knew exactly what they wanted to do when they left school, you know, pretty much in that first year. And so they just blossomed. They, they went from being good good students to you know very good because they were studying subjects that they were really enthralled by yeah and that really helps you know once you get rid of all the stuff you don't want um your studies don't stop being a chore and start being something of interest Hmm. the sheep and cattle station was that a successful venture yeah well it was a family venture so it had been many generations in the family so um, but it's it, everyone's well my father's dead now so um, and you know grandmother so there's no one there anymore mm. no, it sort of ended with our generation because we were two girls so there wasn't a son we we were educated in Brisbane too so we lost our connection I suppose to the bush mm. um, earlier yeah well what triggered the family's move to Brisbane then to... our education I think yeah right. so mum and my mother wasn't from there She's a city girl, and I think she did it pretty tough mm. for those years, having to adjust because it's it's rough. And and you know, if you get five years of drought, it's a nightmare. Mm. You know, you're really beholden to the weather. So um, yeah. It's, when did you last go back to St George? Mm, gosh, it's years ago. Well, now that there's, I really don't have anyone there anymore. So um, I would I went back uh, when the boys were little. So I haven't been back in about twelve years. Mm. So mm. and. Yeah, I, I would like to go back. It's a lovely town. Yeah. So Jan Power put it in your head that you should uh, study at culinary, culinary school. Yes. Correct? So how did you go about making that happen? Um, well, I became an apprentice chef and um, I did an apprenticeship at a restaurant um, in Brisbane called Scaramouche. And that was run by Peter Hackworth, who's also, um, she was also an identity in Brisbane, um, and she runs the Riverside Markets. Coincidentally, the two women, you know, both went into markets. But back then, she was a restaurateur with her husband David, and um, and so this was a uh, it was a restaurant in a church, and it's now sort of under one of the bypasses in um, oh, I've forgotten the street name, but it's in, it, it's on it's along North Quay, but it it was there, and it was a lovely old church that they converted to a restaurant that was there for many years. Um, and then I went overseas and I did some further education um, at a culinary school called La Varenne in Paris. Mm. Did you enjoy your apprenticeship? Um, no. Um, I, I enjoyed learning, but it, it's quite, it was quite terrifying. You know, kitchen, kitchen, a la carte kitchens are terrifying places, especially for tiny little women. Um, you know, you, you physically... It, there's a reason why there's so there are less female chefs than male. It's, it's an extremely uh, demanding, physically, emotionally demanding, and it's draining. Hmm. Did you know this going into it? No. Ah. No. No. I, 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 well, no. Jan had a catering business that I'd worked for, so I knew about hard work and I knew about it, the intensity and the length. But again, that was catering. So y- there's a there's an end point. So if you're doing a wedding and you're making a hundred canapes five different times, then you're making an entree, then a main, you're making and you're multiplying it by a hundred. You know that at eleven o'clock, you you know it's all going to be done and that you're going home, and then you're not going back the next morning. With a la carte, it's split shifts, so you finish late, you start early, you've got a useless gap in the middle of the day, mm. and you know it, it, and then you just you're on that treadmill, you're back again. So I have such enormous respect for, you know, restaurant chefs because it's a tough, tough, tough gig. Whereas a catering job, there may be days 
between them all just small corporate you know runs so you you have some downtime you don't at christmas but you do mm. you know you do you do have downtime at, that that restaurant chefs don't get what kept you going did you come close to quitting um no n- not until after i'd had three children um that became because i had three under one so that was sort of significant i didn't time my children very well i had twins and then i had a badly timed triplet 11 months later <laughs> wow so i had three under one and and running a catering company and and having f- three babies who couldn't walk talk or feed themselves it, it, it was two full-time jobs and it became unsustainable so i did i took some time off um, but not, I mean, I, I stepped back a bit and um, I only did the sort of significant ones so that I could be there for the kids. Hmm. Um, but I worked through a lot of it. Um, it. I actually found babies easier to leave at home than I did children because once they grew up a bit and they wanted me at their their school play and their this and that, you know, and their, their sports and things, it just seemed wrong hmm. to be outsourcing that part of my job Mm. Um, and so I started to outsource that part of my catering by getting a chef in and because I had my own catering company at that stage and so I rearranged so that I started to do the more of the office work and less and prep through the day but not going to the jobs at night Mm. Um, because you know I wanted to put my kids to bed and feed them you know and I was feeding everybody else but not them so that doesn't make any sense (laughs) no no you went to Paris did anything strike you as different between the Australian and Parisian food cultures? Yeah, well, back then a lot because our food culture was only just beginning. Um, our our food culture was confused because um, we had a lot of Asian fusion, which was a lot of confusion, and um, you didn't see that in Paris. You know that they were, you know, what sort of they were so true to themselves. They're so regional, like Italy and India and. You know, you do not get risotto in the south and you don't get calamari in the north in, of Italy. It's the same in France. You know, there are regions and they... But it's more... It's more um, in, in Italy, it's produce-driven. In France, it's technique-driven. So in Lyon, you'll eat Lyonnaise food and it's, as, it's, it's like a microcosm within the greater um, culture that is... French cuisine, right. so and it's the same in the Bourgogne. You'll eat differently than you do in the Perigord, and um, there's obviously produce. You know, it differs um, with the climate and so forth. But it's also it's a um, an area that I think um, you know they're very proud of and they're very parochial about it. Mm. And and we weren't. We were sort of you know we had a hangover from the the British. We hadn't yet been too Americanized because there was no internet. Yeah. And um, but Asia was a definite uh, influence, you know, and I think a really good influence, a wonderful influence. But we weren't being pure. We were trying to take our our classic techniques, and a lot of the chefs in those restaurants were Swiss and German, uh, because the culinary institutes of uh, Switzerland and Germany and Austria were very strong, and France. So they were French, Swiss, or German, largely, unless they were Italian, which is, you know, a, a whole other thing. But the the basis was a, a European formal formal training, and then they'd layer ingredient Asian ingredients or Asian techniques over the top of that. And sometimes it worked, hmm. and a lot of the time it didn't. Um, so, our foot, you know, our menu. I used to describe them as all things to all men, you know, that, so that, you know, for the one that wants the Asian flavour, there's this and, you know, so there was no clear direction and now I think that that's, I now think we, we lead the world. Mm. I think France has stayed in its little microcosms to a degree and hasn't moved on. Britain has, you know, America has, Australia and New Zealand have brilliantly, you know, considering we're so far away, it doesn't, you know, we're... We're so damn good at this cooking thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's all right. An Australian in Paris at that time, learning to be a chef, were you uh, a kind of a rare rare bird at that time? Um, Yes. Well, I was the only one in my cooking school. Um, I mean, Aussies have been travelling since the 
the beginning of time. I've never gone anywhere in the world that I haven't met another Aussie. Um, and I think that it was, it's as much, I mean, certainly was I a rare bird in Paris? No, hell no. Um, but the culinary school was run by an English woman, amazingly, and, um, and very successfully so. Mm. Um, and... Sorry. If you need to answer it then. I just... Um, I've just said to my son, you know, I'm being interviewed. Oh, by who? He started to chat. <laughs> I, thought, I thought he would understand. <laughs> the message was back. <laughs> Shush. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> No, I think, but uh, it was sort of wealthy Americans in these in these schools and and English, you know, coming across. So there weren't that many Australians doing the culinary thing at that that point. Mm. But Marco Pierre White was sort of the big name at the time, and I was just madly in love with him as a young woman. I just thought he was the best thing since sliced bread. And um, you know, it's amazing now that you know, thirty years has passed, and he's now on the most commercial of television shows in Australia you know his 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 career has brought it you know we were the few that used to go in, in search of doing a stage with someone like that or you know having even going to cooking classes that he was having and you know and now here he is on you know Australian television every <laughs> you know with a regular gig every year it's extraordinary are you still madly in love with him no, I kind of got over that. <laughs> I think it was more of a crush. Mm-hmm. Throughout this time, moving between various places, I imagine you were expanding your understanding and appreciation of food. Mm-hmm. How did you uh, solidify those concepts in your mind? Were you, were you taking notes at this time or was it all internal? Um, I tend to read a lot. Um, I've always been a visual person. I don't write. I write a lot more st- now that there's I've got a computer available to me Mm. handwritten notes well obviously I did because you didn't have we didn't have much of a choice I mean we didn't have tablets and things like that so um, I think I think it's more that you you come of age and you develop a style and I remember somebody I was being interviewed for Vogue Live Entertaining which is a magazine that doesn't exist anymore but it was a very strong magazine back then and they were doing a fe- feature article on me. And the interviewer mentioned my style. She said, your style is very X, Y, Z. And I, I was shocked. And, um, and then I had a look at it, sort of in a more dispassionate light. And I realized, yes, she's right. And I do tend to veer towards that. But then I've, I've, yeah, I've moved on from that again, you know. And so whilst like a classically trained chef will always start with the basics and, you know, like a French chef will usually start with the very basics. I think being a chef and, and a food writer in Australia has, has meant that we're just in this, you know, this glorious fruit bowl of ideas, innovation, product, pro- products, produce. Mm. So we, we just can't be single-minded about it. And so I tend to go... Um, from a nationality point of view so if I want to really hone my Italian skills I will just cook predominantly Italian and you know not being a restaurant owner I can do it because I just it's just home and so I I just made my boys eat what I wanted to cook for their entire so (laughs) and sometimes that was good (laughs) and sometimes not so good but you know to teach myself and then if I couldn't get it I would go to the country and you know Indian for example I just couldn't master it everyone thinks it's just easy you just knock a curry up it's absolutely not it's incredibly nuanced and um, there's a lot of technique involved and it's unbelievably regionalized and so I went there for a month and I came back and I still couldn't cook curries I ate nothing but Mm. I did cooking classes I still couldn't cook the curry that I wanted and then one day I was making what they call a Carolyn stew it's a really light mild um, curry like ginger based and um, and I tasted it and it was like somebody else's curry it didn't taste like mine and I thought I nailed it <laughs> but it took years that, wow. that's only about five years ago six years ago so mm. it took a, a lifetime <laughs> to make a good curry <laughs> 
who are you reading? What who influenced your your writing and your, your um, recent career? Elizabeth David was probably the greatest influence. Um, I loved that she was such a cow. You know, she but she and, and she was so austere with her language. You know, there was never a superfluous word in there ever. She was um, she she had great economy uh, in that way, and she also had the incredible. She just had such a grasp on simplicity. She had a really hard life as well. Her backstory is is a is a is of a, a tough life, but she just she just embraced what the Mediterranean and what France and and you know the southern Mediterranean is uh, is so good at, which is taking four or five ingredients, the hero of which ends up that you know, stays the hero throughout. So and 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 eating purely by the season, so not not you know not bringing cherries from california to australia in july like we do you know you've got to miss something to really Mm -hmm. appreciate it and so you know if you can get stone fruit all year round that's not right you know and so she wrote recipes in a um, conversational form so she would it wasn't just a list of ingredients and then a method it was just take take some peaches and add a you know some butter it, it, it and so you she left some creativity in there for you and she also you know i suppose she she could have set you up for a bit of failure yeah, yeah. <laughs> there as well so she she was really a cook for cooks for other cooks you know she her and her recipe books i just took so much from i have every single one of them i've devoured everything and it reminds me i haven't looked at her for a while but hmm. you know she she was very formative it, i felt like i knew her wow just to go back to the chronological account, how long did you mm. spend in Paris and what was the transition between there and the catering business? Um, so going back, uh, th- that was really after I finished um, at Scaramouche and a few other places in, Bris- in Brisbane. I married then and then went over. And so I, we, we did blocks in France. I, I was there, um, I, I sort of did my Europe, England travel when I was much younger. And then I, um, I sort of married at, at about 23, 24, and then, and then we would go back for, I'd go for longer, and my husband had come, and um, I would do, say, a block of six weeks, the cooking. And then we had we'd friends in the Loire Valley, and so we'd go down there, and I'd li- literally be able to live the life. So go to the local farmers and, you know, buy goat's cheese from the goat's cheese farmer, and he would have a rabbit that he caught that morning on the on the bench just sitting there skinned so you know that's what we'd have for lunch because it was in front of us mm. i think in in and i went to france every year sometimes twice for until i had kids and then it all went to hell in a handbasket <laughs> no, i'm kidding <laughs> but life changed pretty significantly it went from being you know working really hard and jumping on a plane and living that sort of rural life now we used to be able to go in in the autumn when it was mushroom season and you know it was amazing and then to have three babies i mean you can't put them on a plane you kid you, you know they'd kill you you'd be lynched so <laughs> i i life changed really dramatically and so and i had them when i was 30 so i think that I, there was about six years of of sorry okay. sorry i don't know how to turn them off <laughs> Uh, Do you? On the side, that little lever. Well, I... Does that turn it off? This one. No, that's power. Are you sure? Oh, no. I this didn't... one. Yeah, oh, that's on silent now. Thank you. Just remember to turn it See? on when I leave. I'll try and remember to <laughs> okay. make a note. Sorry. Was that a shock to the system, having lived a fairly high-flying kind of um, career at that point? Yeah, yeah. It, w- it, it was. But, I mean, you know, I, I had three babies as compensation. And, and while they were a lot of hard work, I mean, they were pretty funny. So life changed. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I don't like to think of one phase as being better than the other. I mean, yes, it, I've probably idealised those, those years. But, I mean, there was a lot of driving to Mount Nebo with wedding cakes and, you know sitting in somebody's backyard at three o'clock in the morning you know waiting for a party to finish and you know there's a lot of slog in in that Mm -hmm. and then when the babies came along you know there's a lot of slog in that but there's also a lot of joy that you just change things you start cooking in a different way and entertaining in a different way and Mm -hmm. a lot of picnics (laughs) (laughs) a lot of picnics (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
your partner, he was in the business, correct? No, no, no he, he's a lawyer. Ah, okay. So, no, he, he was just good at eating. <laughs> <laughs> good consumer. <laughs> right. Did you learn anything from him in terms of he would eat your food? Did, you, did he teach you anything about <laughs> law or his... his um, <laughs> well, the divorce did, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> I learned a lot about law, ah, law during indeed. those years. <laughs> Tough um, point. <laughs> yeah, look, he he was a, he was a, an appreciator of, of good food, and he he had an unbelievable palate. And I don't know where it came from. He doesn't have any background like that. It's just a god given, and um, he could remember. But it was he'd, he'd honed it on wine, and he also had like a photographic memory. So I would I would be able to sort of articulate what I was tasting, and he would go the Alsace. 96 blah 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 and so we could piece together you know it was hmm. we did in that sense make a pretty good team across the table right. but he didn't he couldn't understand why you know he would have to participate in any of the cooking or cleaning up <laughs> that's interesting what you just said about the unbelievable palate mm. you felt you had to earn yours it was very hard earned you didn't it didn't come naturally to you whereas you looked at him and you thought I look, I, I think mine had sort of developed a, as a child because I, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, it wasn't hard earned because mm. it was just hard, I, it, it was sort of, I didn't recognise. But I, I remember got my heart sinking when I knew what mum had cooked as a 13 year old girl and knowing that, or smelling something and thinking, oh God, we're having this tonight, oh God. And you know, I can I can smell something, I can taste it, and I can reverse engineer a recipe, and that, that's a hobby. Wow! So you know, and I know that started at about twelve or thirteen. I know that, and so that it smells are really so aromas for me are as big as taste, and so when I saw someone who had no education in in culinary anything be able to do that, I was like, hang on a minute. <laughs> You have to go back and do your apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's when I realised that there was, you know, and and having people around a table, and some people just not seeing or, you know, tasting what what you're tasting. It made that made me realise that there's different levels, and I've been always fascinated. Like, is are those lemons the same colour to you as they are to me? Do they smell the same? There's just no way of quantifying what you know we, we say. I say that's yellow, but what's what's my yellow to your yellow? Mm. And it's the same with with your palate. You know, what what do you taste? It, it's just, we're we're so individual. Mm. So that area is sort of will never be known. That must be part of the attraction, right? Yeah, it's an unending process. Yeah, it it is because it means you know without sounding like a complete you know food wanker or a wine wanker, it, it you know for people who are also interested, it's fun to explore it. You know, it's not fun for those who are not. And there are a lot of people who just want food for fuel and don't really get the enjoyment out of, you know, drilling down and, and you know, and no one does all the time either. But it's it, it's definitely a lot... It, it's what happened. I don't necessarily verbalise it, but it's what happens when I eat with people. I think about it. Mm. And, I yeah, I definitely think, what are they... What you are know, they really what feeling are they? Yeah. and experiencing? Yeah, yeah. Huh. But you can never know. Like you, you never said, know. that's part no. of the mystery, it's part of the just, joy of life. Just that out. <laughs> it's just that bit. It's it's not there. Developing a palate and a vocabulary, is that purely an exposure thing, so being exposed to as many things as possible? For me, it, I think so, yeah. I mean, you can... Yeah, I think for everyone, really. I, I can't see how you could... You can't have a really broad palate if you haven't tasted you know if you've only ever eaten french food how can you have a really broad palate i mean you can with all the basics you know like the the umami and the you know the um the sweet and the savory but then when you're talking in individual ingredients and their the flavors that are derived from the combinations thereof you know that's where you have to get out and so travel is because you can't you can't taste on the internet and that's what I think a lot of people are armchair travellers these days, and I hope that doesn't continue because I think the one, one negative about being really well educated um, from the the world of online is that t you, you can't smell, you can see, but you can't use those really important 
uh, triggers and you know of taste mm. and smell and so you know and you can't replace that and so you know I mean I'll, I'll smell I'll smell coriander and I go straight away to Bangkok and you know I, I just think that's so influential you know because if you you then it takes you on a, a sort of a journey within a journey you know you're seeing sights and you're seeing a different culture and you're hearing a different language but you're also tasting a completely different cuisine but you're seeing people who do exactly the same as you do you know go to a restaurant every day and cook but it's their techniques are so different it's it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> when did you start aiming to be published as a food writer How i didn't that? really aim okay i um i fell into it i was um out catering company had won an award and I was they, they had Amex awards back in the day and we won the Amex award for best caterer and I was I happened to sit next to the new editor of the Korean of the Korean Mail good life section who had come she was a Brisbane girl but she had been in Sydney and overseas and and I was chatting to her and she said can you write I said I've got no idea <laughs> and I had been writing for a little independent press thing that honestly three people read and I was that all of their names were lol and um, I said look I said I've written a few of them she said can you send them to me and I did and she said how about you become the new restaurant critic that was Kylie Lang oh there you go so and she's still my editor although I have had a hiatus and she's she went elsewhere we haven't sort of worked together for the 20 years but we've certainly known each other so she was wonderful she gave me a chance she knew I wasn't you know she knew I was a beginner at this and she saw something in me and she decided to go with it and um, you know it used to take me hours to write the one review mm. review and then I'd panic and and then she would give me feedback and I'd get better and you know now I, now I can pretty much do it <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine <laughs> and so. been a couple of decades <laughs> yes I certainly get the uh, feeling of confidence through, through everything that I read in Kiwi Can <laughs> well you know, it, you're talking about. it is two decades mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Of, of doing it in the same city so um, yeah. I, I guess I've got it down pat you know I hope I have to some degree <laughs> from the beginning those first reviews did you trust your instincts did you know that you were right yes yeah I did I just didn't tr- trust my grammar I didn't trust um, my ability to convey it you know in a manner that people would want to read and so I I've had people say to me you you write like you speak and but that's because I'm not a trained journalist no one taught me how to write so I just it's a sort of conscious stream of consciousness to me that's a compliment I would take that as a compliment yeah though. yeah I did I, I did I, it is I'm, you know but I think I didn't learn from the school of X or the school of Y and so I wasn't styled in a, in a certain fashion mm. and Kylie um, you know while she has her particular style which is different to mine she allowed my voice in there and my personality and so I was really lucky you know to have someone like that um, who was happy to edit my, you know, stupid mistakes, my typos and gobble because we didn't have spell check back in the day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Those first few, what, what, when were you first published in Korean? 99, Mail? I think, okay. 99, 97. Honestly, can't remember. Yeah. But it's a long time ago. What were your, what were the mechanics of the job back then? Would you have a notebook and pen and like sneakily take notes? Look, or? I didn't. Um, and we didn't have cameras or iPhones or anything. So um, I had to really employ that photographic sort of, when I say photographic memory, it's, I don't have a photographic memory. What I do have is the ability to like take a, a snapshot in my brain. So I would, all I have to do is stop talking for a minute which was hard, I've got to say. But I've, found, I've found that. <laughs> Stop talking and look at the dish and take it all in and, and then it was like a, a click. And so then I'd have to revisit that image in my brain and out it had come. But I never made notes. Unless, oh, very complicated dinners I did. Um, never, I've never made a note at the table. I would come home and, and jot things down um, either that night or the next morning. And then I'd write the review from there. Were you like on the car ride home, or did you have to stop socialising and just push people away and say, "No, no it's kind of uh, whatever you 
felt the day after was it was it was like a marination so um it was i might have a knee-jerk reaction to something that night um positive or negative i might get a bit over enthusiastic about something or i might um not really understand or like something and so you never like it's never a good idea to just write it and then send it you you know so even if i did write it i would always read it again after some time i'd always give it 24 hours and then have another look at it and you i still change now like the one i edited this morning i changed and i you know i feel like i get the main points down i don't change the content anymore but i change the language around it more okay. and I'm sort of, I don't know, it's just, I suppose I'm just, it's bringing in that economy of words. You know, I, I, I go in there and I try and get as many, what can you get rid of in this sentence? And that's, you know, it's a good fun challenge. Do dining companions help a food critic? Look, dining com- com- companions come in all different shapes and sizes. So um, the ones that think they're critics, no. They're, um, they're not as helpful because they're pointing things out that you don't really need pointed out. Um, the ones that just, you know, or, or then there are ones that are, are almost trepidatious. And they're like, what should I order? Like, yeah, yeah. Whatever you like. Overthinking. <laughs> I want you to, yeah, overthinking. I want you, because they're, they're important to me because they're, they're, they're who I'm writing for. So they're the representative. And so if, they, if they're going to hone in on that that thing then you know the chances are so are the readers so you know their reactions are really important to me but I, I want them to be genuine and not sort of you know overthought or you know in that way and most of them are I've got sort of long termers lifers I like to call them <laughs> people you can call up and they'll come along and yeah. they know how you operate and they don't need to yes. put on false airs and pretenses exactly and uh, yeah they all they need to do is eat drink and be merry <laughs> <laughs> and just That's an easy pause part. talking every now and then so you can take a mental picture. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> or, or, or I can just tune them out. They can keep talking. <laughs> no, it's. But I like taking. I've got a few. Uh, one particular friend, very old friend, uh, is a really meat and potatoes man, and so I take him to all the really avant-garde places. <laughs> and he's just. You can see that he's a bit cross at first, <laughs> and then the food comes, and he's got to admit that it's amazing. You know, so it's fun. <laughs> the inner beast in me (laughs) so you're writing for the average person who might walk into a restaurant and sit down was that the case from the beginning did you always have that average person in mind absolutely that's something you discussed with Kylie yes yeah definitely um you know that that was definitely the editorial brief um but it was also a thought in my mind was um I'm so fortunate to be able to go to you know every single you know good bad or great restaurant that opens in Brisbane I get to go to that is so not normal and most people it, you know it's a special occasion that that brings them to that I mean obviously there's lots of people who eat out a lot but this is going back a, a while there to me the people that eat out a lot need my reviews less than people who are you know maybe on a budget that only allows them to go out once or twice a year and to have a bad experience on that one time that you're going with your family or your friends, that to me is just, would be crushing. And we used to have really pretentious service in Brisbane, or all over Australia, you know, where the waiters, you know, knew more than the customer and, you know, the menus had foreign language terms and, um, you know, Rocket was a Ruglia and like, we don't live in Italy, why? Just call it Rocket. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was that sort of, and, and I used to hear people say, I'm, you know, I went in and I, they express uh, the feelings of being judged and um, not being good enough to walk into a restaurant door. And so that's been my guide ever since. So I write for those people um, so that they understand. That's why I don't only write about the food. I write about the decor and the ambience and um, and the style of the restaurant. And you know, I, I like people to understand the 
the the non tangibles that you're going to feel because it is all about the experience, right? It's absolutely, not just about the food. definitely not. Yeah. No, I mean it's a big part. It's sixty percent, but yeah. um, that forty is also really important. And you know, you, you can get away with a sauce that wasn't perfect if the waiter was really personable and the rest, of, and you felt really looked after. You know, when people complain about their dining experience, it's rarely the food. They say it. They say, "Oh, we had a terrible meal." But in fact, they had a good meal that was badly served, and so those that fr- that front of house staff is just vital. They're just the they're the, the first and last. They're the middle, you know, and and they dictate how people see their meal. So you know, the perfect steak served by an arrogant waiter suddenly becomes a bad experience. Mm. And so you know, I think it's really, really important that that front of house experience is and and I also think it needs to reflect who we are and where we are and you know we're Brisbane we're casual we're we're fluid we're innovative we don't do the airs and graces thing you know and we're confident and you know when you see that in a in a collective group at the front of house it's just it's a great thing you know I I think of tourists then in getting to know the city through our restaurants and cafes yeah which is good working or with your background in the food industry here in brisbane did you have a lot of contacts throughout the city of of restaurant owners or producers well you inevitably you do you would you know i mean it's it's just bigger and bigger and bigger now but now that there's there's sort of a generation between me now or two you know like you know my son's a chef and so i think i've got contact probably with the younger Gen Y is because of him in not so much as with what I do but you know um, I'm I'm watching cafes and I'm watching what young people 20 somethings are doing obviously for my own job but there's another layer or, or, or another way I can I can sort of get to know more and yeah I've known I, I do know a lot you can't really review someone's restaurant and be their friend though so that that part's um, you know, you've got to stay professional on that. But other than mm. other than that, you know, I, I sort of, I guess, I know the backstories um, of a, a lot of restaurant people mm. and producers and things. I'd say, yeah. But it's 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 always growing. There's always someone new, you know, which is exciting. Yeah, I found a similar thing with my music reviewing. If mm. I have spent time with someone or know a bit more beyond the press release, for instance it starts to play on your mind. You, you kind of know too much and you start imagining them <laughs> not as, you know, a mysterious figure but as a real person who yes. may end up reading the review and you become concerned about how they'll take it. Yes. Or like All that enters your mind. Yes. But, you know, positively written, um, genuine critiquing has nothing to do with knocking someone down, you know, and... And so if, if you're always doing it for the greater good, so that, I mean, you must be writing for your readers, not for your... For Rest- your restaurateurs or... Restaurateurs owners. or your, um, you know, your vocalists or your musicians. Mm-hmm. You must be writing. And, and ultimately, if they have to take a, a little bit of criticism along the way, most, the, the, the good ones, will always take it on board and see that you, are, you have looked at the whole thing and that you've assessed it in a holistic way and, you know... Is every one of my articles fantastic? No. Nope. You know, have I made mistakes along the way? Have I had bad days? Hell yeah. I couldn't make a curry till I was 45. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we've, we've all got to accept that we're not perfect. Yeah. You know, it's, or it's also personal taste. I mean, nothing's more subjective than music. Yeah, yeah. You know, I would have thought. Or food. <laughs> or food. Yeah, similar, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, very similar. <laughs> you know, so when you're critiquing the suggest, you know, the su- suggestive, you know, sort of when you're criti- critiquing something that is one thing to you and a different thing to me, then you're always going to have a difference of opinion. Did, how how soon did you start getting feedback after Kyla started publishing your work? About a week. <laughs> who who from the average reader or from the owners or all no sorts? Um, uh, from everyone from other journalists. Um, there, some journalists had an issue with me. One, one very well-known journalist said, "I was asked what they thought of my, st- you know, the new kid on the block and my style." And he apparently said, um, "She won't last 
she can't last, she knows too much. And he thought I was drilling down too far into the actual food and that, that restaurant reviews should be a fluff piece. And, you know, so, you know, he, he thought that the readers would get bored with my detail, hmm. level of detail. But those reviews were a thousand words in those days. Wow. Um, and others, you know, others didn't like the fact that, you know, that a long, the long term person that was in the job before me had left. Sorry. <laughs> I'll note the cat just jumped on my lap and is now on the table <laughs> looking at the microphone. Okay, you need to get down. <laughs> Seriously. A thousand words. Did you enjoy that link? No. No. <laughs> but then I was so adjusted to it. But then I started um, writing the restaurant guides. and they, So that's 500 reviews of 100 words. So that had to, you know, I had to really put some verbs into my what? sentences. And, yeah, you know. Is that all really you? Really compound. Oh no, not all me. There were there. I had a co-editor, and okay. um, and I had reviewers that went out. But I, every single one of them was subbed, and then the ones that I'd written, my co-editor would read. Excuse me, I'm just going to have to discipline the cat. Sorry, self discipline. <laughs> right. And um, yes, so there's a, that. They, that was a massive job. It was about nine months of just pure editing, Did you enjoy reviewing. It? I did, yeah, I did. It became like I did it for five years, and it was probably enough. I think mm. um, doing these those sorts of really repetitive jobs, there are not enough adjectives in the world to write. I imagine a um, to write a, a, a guide with five hundred five hundred and fifty. Yeah. All um, right, tell me what comes to mind. Most overused adjectives in food writing. Delicious. <laughs> Isn't that the name of like one of the big magazines? Mm, it is. It's, <laughs> I write for Delicious, <laughs> um, but it's it comes off. My, it rolls off my tongue every single time I'm writing a positive review, because it's so there's there isn't it's 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 overused because it's it doesn't have a, compa- um, a, a comparable. There's nothing like it mm. to describe it. What else are you going to say? Yummy. You know, which th- sounds childlike, well, right? Well, yeah, childish. you either go, you either go, yeah, child, you know, in a in a childish sort of um, way, or you go pretentious, you know, and it was sublime, or you know, can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. I've 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 wished for more adjectives, culinary hmm. adjectives, so many times. <laughs> hmm. But they're just not coming. Funnily enough, I know. they're not making new they're adjectives. Really not. They're not making new adjectives. <laughs> We should complain to someone about that. <laughs> you could coin some words. Yes. Coin your own words. Yes, well, I've thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Which other critics were you writing at that time? Oh, sorry, were you reading at that time when you started writing? Um, A.A. Gill yeah. um, in, in England. Um, and, you know, winners, dinners. Uh, uh, Britain for me was... Oh, and Ruth Reichel, sorry. In, um, she started out in uh, Berkeley as a young... She was in that sort of um, the Berkeley, um, sort of the the beginning of the green and organic movement out of um, that Bay Area um, with um, Shape and East and oh, I won't get all their names, but it was a big movement and a very very important movement in um, in America. Sort of sh- shaped, you know, the, the culinary side of America. And um, she then took up the, the post at the New York Post as restaurant critic, and she's written some most incredible, beautiful writer. And um, again, not a trained journalist, more of a food person, but just beautiful writer, and um, you know had a fantastic story to tell. And um, and then A. A. Gill is just—he's the funniest man alive. Um, and so those two, are, those were columns I never missed. Were there? Who were the big names in Australian food criticism at that time when um, starting? Jill, Terry Durack was the big one. Um, and um, who else was back in the day? Jill Duplay and Terry were the two, were the biggest food people and in that entire for decade. Newspapers for like yeah. big audiences? Yeah. So Vogue Entertaining was um, the big magazine and then Gourmet Traveller. And um, Terry, and then it was Sydney Morning Herald and Mel- Melbourne Age, and they were syndicated so that, mm. just like you know, the News Limited are, so that those um, those liftouts, whether they're travel or you know, 
arts or food would be syndicated so they'd they'd have some local content and the rest of it was um, produced by the one so Terry's columns you know would be would appear in Sydney and Melbourne and so they were really influential mm. um, and he would dot between the two um, you know doing restaurants in Sydney and in Melbourne did you become a bigger reader of food criticism once you were one? Yeah, I did. Yeah, Stephen Downs was the sort of local restaurant critic in um, in Melbourne, and um, I I got to know him fairly well. I mean, we were a tight little clique at one stage, um, and um, Simon Thompson um, took over from Matt Evans, and he was the one uh, restaurant critic for a long time in the Sydney Morning Herald, and he um, he was the one who famously was sued. Um, I don't know about this. Oh, Tell me more. I, I should start with Leo Schofield was the first big critic, and I've you know he's I still writes columns, opinion columns, but he was sued and successfully sued because he he um, you can have a poetic license when you describe something, but it must be in a, in context. And he said that the I think it, I from memory said the prawns were incinerated, but the the court argued that he had never tasted incinerated prawns, so he really oh. couldn't. Wow. say that and so he lost that and then there were years later Matthew Evans was in the chair so it started with uh, Leo and then Matthew was sued by a, a, a restaurant he, he gave it nine out of 20 and um, they sued and lost and they appealed and won and I think it's just settled I think uh, it, it went on it dogged him you know he, he was covered by his employer you know Fairfax mm. um, but, you know, it meant his participation in a, a really long-running, really bitter court case. So, you know, we, when, when we heavily uh, criticise something, it, our work is legaled, you know, so we're covered. Wow, well, that's one difference between music and food, for example, because I'm, I don't think I've ever heard of a, a music review being legaled before publication. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's really, really negative. I, for whatever reason, uh, that's acceptable wow. in the, the music criticism. Isn't that sense. right? Yeah. That's incredible because, you know, it, I mean, it, it is, I suppose, it, uh, oh, I don't know what the difference would be. I can't imagine. I would have thought it would all be the same because it could be seen as, you know, um, detrimental to the business of, of yeah. being a musician. Maybe re- restaurateurs are more... Litigious. <laughs> litigious or precious or sensitive. Or, I don't know. Mm, that's an interesting one. Yeah, look, it very rarely happens. You know, I can really only quote you two times yeah. in my entire career. So um, it's it's very, very rare. And, you know, but, I, you know, it's also rare to find a restaurant that's really, really, really bad. Hmm. Thank well, God. What has intrigued me about your reviews in Q Weekend in the last couple of years is... I've always perceived you as a hard marker. I've only you ever seen you, only ever seen you give above, say, seventeen, maybe a handful of times, if ever. I don't know. Like you gave seventeen two weeks in a row recently, and mm. I was amazed. It was mm. it was news to shout from the rooftops. <laughs> Lizzie's Lizzie's happy with two restaurants. There was a lot of I I I get that feedback a lot, um, and, and I don't think I am a hard marker. Um, because I think I, I like to review on a national and an international scale. So mm. if Noma decided that they were going to come to Brisbane, I have to have somewhere to go to, to score them. So if I've given somewhere that really isn't of that calibre, 19 out of 20, what the hell am I going to do, you know? So I, I really you do have to have that sort of global thought and while I don't get to eat out all over the world all of the time that's where the internet does come into play and I you you do look at techniques and that is what I do when I go overseas anytime I travel is restaurants 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 keeping abreast talking to people techniques and that's why I think I can I don't have to experience it all the time because I am a chef so it's it's I'm really lucky I can see what they're doing and I can see trends and I can see when it's well done and when it's really badly done and so I can read it in their menu you can read it there's a subtext going on when you read how a a restaurant menu is written and um, you can pretty well know what to expect and so you know 15 out of 20 or 16 out of 20 is an incredibly good mark it's just that there are 
there are very few you won't have seen eight nine out of 20 much either no so no. you don't see the highs and you don't see the lows and there are so many restaurants opening up like last year I reviewed 50 times and 46 of them were new restaurants Wow! so I don't get to revisit old uh, older restaurants because I'm constantly at the newbies and that's what the public want they want to you know they hear about it it's all over the blogs they want the critic to go and check it out for them before they waste their money and that's my job and so there's so many that come in around that 13 to 15 because they are middle of the road hmm. then and that's not middle of the road is 10 that's right that's right it's always so always something to keep in mind they're hellishly good you know if they're getting 15 I'm giving them a great big pat on the back and if they're getting 16 or 17 I'm giving them a hug you know and I, so it's sort of a perception thing that yeah. I don't know that I am such a hard marker it's just realistic hmm. like we did change the wording around the marks um, the redesign with, yeah with, uh, no before Christmas time because I was getting a lot of that feedback uh -huh. and I read the legend and I thought wow um, that's that it was actually that the legend that was a little harsh and so we changed it because I wanted it to reflect because I, I think if you're getting 14 out of 20 it's a it's a good score you're four over the line you mm. know and yeah there's a there's a ways to go but you know 15 I mean also with the restaurant guides the scoring was 15 out of 20 is one star 16 out of 20 is two stars mm. now you can't bank stars and and they will actually work against you hmm. if you go and you get yourself three stars and then you're reviewed again and you are down to two stars bad news hmm. and that makes all the papers and the blogs you hmm. know again so you know if you want to be a successful restaurant in the mainstream and and make money out of it as well as do your craft really well aim for two stars hmm. don't aim for that third because you put yourself up into the third percentile and, right. and you'll become rarefied yeah you know and a target and you can generally only go down from there exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's very hard to maintain and also you know i mean cities of our size can really only support a few of them mm. a very few of them and once they've opened i can't they can't be re-reviewed so you know unless something significant happens like a change of ownership or chef or something a uh, new direction whatever but you know then they'd sort of be back up but with the proliferation of new restaurants you know you don't get to revisit so hmm. I'm not that hard a marker <laughs> well the way you've explained it now is I completely understand and mm. like you said 10 is the middle ground anything above 10 is above average yeah right? yeah it really is but it's a similar kind of thing in music writing like out of five stars two and a half is the average but the yes. perception is That's that two and a half is a bad album yeah even yeah. three stars is uh, yeah. not so good, yeah, like not worth your time. Yeah. It's funny the perception people have around yeah. criticism yeah, and, and ratings in particular. Ratings, and t ratings is tough. Do you think you would like uh, reviewing restaurants without a rating? If it was purely about the, the words and probably more adjectives as a result? Yeah, <laughs> if we could pluck out a few more adjectives. <laughs> um, no, um, well, I used to score on four different things. So I used, it used to be food, wine, service, and ambience, and then um, and then there was an overall score. And then I, I looked, and it, no one, it, people were commenting on social media, and saying saying, "Oh, she scored at sixteen, but I had only scored the food sixteen. They weren't taking any notice of the other three scores, and so we simplified it and just gave it an overall hmm. score. You know." It, and it has become, you know, with the distillation of all media, there's, um, you know, there's less words going into it. You've got to, you know, you've got to give a picture in, we, we do 500, 550 words now. And so you've got to in, sort of encapsulate it. F photography is really important um, for, especially a, a magazine. Do you give notes on what would be best to be photographed? For I example? choose what's photographed. Okay, wow. Well. Yeah, so I send the pick request in to the, the photographers mm. and um, choose the dish mm -hmm. so the, uh, and so I take into account what I've eaten obviously uh, what will photograph well but so much photographs well these days you know back in the day when it was a great big steak on a plate with some potato it you know that's not going to make a pretty picture but 
photographers can do amazing things these days and restaurants mm-hmm. do amazing things so mm. you know you tend to sort of give it a what I feel is a gist of what that chef wanted to put out there I'll, I'll choose I'll eat that you know I'll choose that from the menu and then I'll I'll get it photographed mm. how often do you take recommendations from wait staff or pay attention to specials or is it purely you just look at the menu and decide what would be a good representation of what's on offer um i do i really do listen to the wait staff because i'm not so much listening for their recommendation as their enthusiasm level of knowledge mm. so if if someone says oh, i don't know i haven't had that bam, bam. <laughs> you know. yeah. or if they say oh, i don't eat fish oh i mean fair enough some people are allergic to it but don't tell that you know you you might say look what's his name had it you know Fred had it the other night and he was raving about it you know but because you you don't expect you you do expect good in a good restaurant you expect that all staff have been given um, a tasting of the new menu so they have all tasted it now those staff are quite within their rights to have preferences and obviously if they have issues with you know um, allergies and things like that but I mean if you are a waiter and if you really are plugged into this industry you want to have as broad a palate as possible and so you know when somebody does say oh I'm not much of a fan of that or I don't know it tells me something it adds to the story Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. coming towards the end just a few more questions for you how often are you recognized when you're reviewing a lot less these days than I ever used to be and that is because I did take a break for a few years I um, I went out and um, sort of opened a restaurant for someone um, and I, I think I was two years out of the industry and a lot changed in that time I became I, I was reviewed god that was scary and um, you know that generation that next generation that my sons are in who are you um, reviewed by I was reviewed by John Lethleen. Uh-huh. And, what um, was the review? I'm sure you remember the rating. Uh, <laughs> um, it was pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good. But four, it wasn't... Four stars? Yeah, no, that was... that was. Oh, hang on. Was it Lethleen? The Australian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, no, I think it was three and a half. So, it's yeah. Above average, Yeah, right? above... Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, told he's a hard that. marker. <laughs> yeah, he is, he is. Yeah, so, you know, it did... And then when I came back in... The, I've what was, never what was seen. The name of that restaurant? Sorry, what was the name of that Spring, restaurant? here in Brisbane, in the city, yeah, yeah in cool. the CBD. When I came back in to reviewing, I was just amazed at how many new restaurants. Because I had stopped going out as much, obviously, because I wasn't writing restaurant guides and I wasn't doing fifty reviews a year. Mm. So I was going out to eat privately, and and I was going to restaurants that I wanted to go to, and I was repeating the visit which you don't get to do as a critic unless you want to be as big as Texas, you know, so you can't be having the calories (laughs) and um, and that you can't write about. So, you know, I will obviously trying new restaurants, but also um, going back to the ones I loved. And um, so it it was a completely different experience. And, um, And in that time, so many new restaurants opened up and the Gold Coast became, you know, a force to be reckoned with. And, you know, so did other parts of the Sunshine Coast um, outside of Noosa, which has always been really strong. The hinterland, you know, came into play. And, you know, so there are so many restaurants now. I'm, I'm obviously, if I walk into restaurants that have been around for 15 years, somebody's going to recognise me. But a lot of places I get away with. Hmm. So, because I haven't met these, these, the young ones, I haven't met them. I, I've read about them, but, you yeah. know, and... and it, they may have read about me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, hopefully, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure some of them might be listening to this podcast when it's released and taking notes on how to please <laughs> Lizzie Lowell. Oh, just do your best. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point about uh, being as big as Texas, actually. I spoke to John Birmingham for this podcast oh, yes. previously, and he was a restaurant reviewer for some time. He Still- was mine. He wrote for The Guide for me oh. for a couple of years. Wow, there you go. Yeah. And he has written about how he struggled with his weight as yeah, a result because yeah, you're eating a lot of yeah. these you know high i don't know high fat high oh, yeah. high content meals yeah. and the life of a writer is sitting at a keyboard so yes. if you're not like yeah. getting up and going for a walk or doing yeah, some exercise which you then... don't want to do and you've got you know i mean who who has three courses at home 
I mean, it's insane to think you're having a small plate of food followed by a very large plate of food followed by a carb and sugar laden dessert. It's extraordinary mm. amount of food, mm. and, no, and none of us, I'm sure, do it very much at home. Maybe, maybe, may like dinner and dessert, but mm. I certainly don't. I can't. No way. <laughs> How often do you finish dishes? Then is it just about sampling a bit of each? Um, um, if it's really, really good, if it's a 16 or a 17 or an 18 or 19, <laughs> I'm going for it. I'm just going for it. I'll just walk home via Toowoomba. You know, I'll just... But um, if it's, if it's you know, something that is, you know, maybe it's a steak restaurant and so you eat the beef, there's no way I can get through it. No way. Mm. Um, but I have a, I have a, as good a crack as, as... You'd be proud of me. For someone who's five foot tall, <laughs> vertically challenged. But if I take one of my ravenous sons not that they live in Queensland anymore but you know when they they'll all be home in a couple of weeks and um so they will all be vying for the restaurant position mm. like, you know one's coming home two days early and I know why <laughs> there's a couple of good restaurants that they want to get to mm-hmm. how often after publication do you get feedback from owners um you get it uh you get it in lots of different ways um you, you, oh, social media just makes it so easy. You don't need someone's phone number to call them anymore. You can just um, message them, um, and so you get you get a bit from that. Sometimes they're direct messages, and sometimes they're a comment um, that you're tagged into, um, and other times they write into the editor. Um, look, it's not, it's certainly not every every week. You know, I think people people if if somebody comments and that somebody else agrees, they might also comment, and so you get a little rush of something you know like like you said you're a hard marker somebody said that and then 50 other people said it and so you know that brought about change because it made me really look at the legend and and realize that it was possibly it it, you know the wording in that was too harsh it it was not reflective of of, um you know of of the how high a 14 or 15 is so did bring change which is great Hmm. You know, it was great. It was something that I don't read that legend every time, you know, it, it, because I don't have it with me when I'm writing the article. And, you know, so it was just a good thing to tweak. It wasn't a big change, but it was a, a tweak. And I hope that it, help, it helped people understand a bit better. Do you ever get angry or praiseful emails direct from the people you've Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you get angry emails. Uh, occasionally you get a thank you note mm. um, and it's rarely from the, the big numbers it's usually from the smart restaurateurs who either use it as a way of talking opening a conversation or a dialogue with their staff mm. um, and you know using it as an outside opinion like a sort of consultant they didn't have to pay for mm. you know and say mm. well here's some feedback let's change this or do this or whatever and so sometimes you hear back from them Bad news is it tends to travel more than good news. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I think I think people, I don't know, they they're either they've either gotten used to my voice and my my way by now or or they hate me. I'm only aware of your QE can work. What else do you do besides those weekly reviews? I do um, I contribute to Delicious magazine and so I do the hotspots that you know of Queensland. I've just sent one in about um, long time. It's a gorgeous little Thai restaurant in Fortitude Valley and then um, and I, so I sort of contribute news to uh, Delicious about Queensland. And then I write for Wine State. I have a news column in that as well. Um, and you know, then then there are sort of random articles mm. that um, that I contribute to, you know, here and there. So I write a fair bit. Enough to keep you busy. <laughs> I edit, uh, I've edited some um, cookbooks for the Noosa Festival, and yeah, um, and then there were the guidebooks for five years, but I don't do them anymore. Well, I will note there are huge stacks of cookbooks <laughs> in almost every flat service in this house. I may be exaggerating. <laughs> no, 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 you're not. <laughs> Have a seat. Look, there's one that's not a cookbook. Anna Bly. <laughs> Someone just gave me that this morning. <laughs> Final question. What are you going to have for lunch? That's a good one. Probably no lunch because I had a big breakfast. But dinner, that's a different story. <laughs> I'm cooking for a friend. I'm going to. I'm preparing some meals uh, for a friend who um, is just having a hard time, not well, and so I'm going to be cooking later afternoon into evening. So I'll be cooking about three different dishes. So I will probably have 
whatever I feel like from that. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks for talking to me, Lizzie. No problem. Thank you for listening to Penmanship and thanks to my guest, Lizzie Lowell. If you'd like to hear past episodes, you can find everything about the podcast, including show notes from this episode at penmanshippodcast.com. If you like what you hear in this podcast, I encourage you to share it with your friends and family, with anyone in your life who is interested in discussing and hearing about great Australian writing. The theme music you've heard throughout this show is Eternally Yours by the Brisbane band Laughing Clowns. Thanks for listening. Till next time. Yeah.